This is Lenico Lee, citizen Minneconjo Lakota of Cheyenne River Sioux Nation in South Dakota and member of the Oak Lake Writers Society, a tribal writers organization of Ocheti Shakoi. Today, our guest for this Native Reads podcast is Monica Brain. She will offer us special insights and sensibilities about the book entitled Witness, a Hunkpapa Historian's Strong Heart Song of the Lakotas by Josephine Wagner and edited by Emily Levine. Greeting to you, Monica. Will you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Lenico. I'm excited to um, talk with you today. I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people in my family that know a lot about uh, Josephine Wagner, and I'm not sure I'm the best person <laughs> to do it, but I'm happy to jump in and, and talk about it. So um, uh, I am a senior producer for a radio show called Native America Calling, which is a live call-in radio show that's on about 70 stations across the U.S., mostly tribal and community stations. I've been doing this for about 10 years, and um, it's radio is, is my passion. I love it so much. I love podcasts, which is like the next version of radio. Um, our show has been on the air for 25 years, which I think is pretty remarkable considering that it's on five days a week. And all we do is talk about issues that are relevant to Native Americans. So um, when I think about my great great grandmother, Josephine Wagner, uh, I just wonder, you know, what she would think about what I'm doing today and about how we're sharing the stories and messages and the history of Native people um, to a national audience. So Josephine was, um, is my great-great-grandmother. My father is Gary Brain. He's, the, he's enrolled at the um, Fort Peck Assiniboine Sioux Tribe, which is um, where I'm from. And um, his father uh, was Carl Brain, who is enrolled at the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And um, Carl's mother was Ramona, and Josephine's daughter um, was Ramona, so of the 10 kids. So m she is my great, great grandmother. My grandparents, mm. they, they met at Haskell. My, great, my grandmother was um, from Fort Peck, and my grandfather was from Standing Rock, and they, they met at Haskell, and they decided they'd raise their family on a whole new reservation. And so they, um, they raised everybody on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in Montana, which is where I was born. So that's a little bit about my history. Oh, my. Lots of couples I've learned over the years have met at Haskell. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, about this book, um, have there been discussions in the family about the book? And when you get together for your family reunions, do... Um, some of the members of the family share information about the book? Yeah, so there's been lots of discussions about the book, even before it became a book. You know, there was discussion about um, this manuscript that was going around and who had a copy of it. And um, it was a really treasured thing. And there was a lot of discussions about how some people, how she wrote uh, for historians and they used her work and didn't credit her for it. And so when Emily, you know, who spent, I would say it's like 10 years of her life compiling all of this, putting this all together in this book, when the book was finally published, my family held a reunion in Denver, Colorado, which was like, we felt like was kind of a, a, a convergence point for all of us because we're all spread out all over the country. And we honored Emily. Um, and uh, we we went to this um, native restaurant called Takabe, and we ate and honored Emily and sat around and talked about the book. And and then we went on to one of my cousin's houses and, and had a big party there and sat and talked some more. And I brought my recorder, of course, and um, recorded some stories from my family, some interesting things that they had to say about what they heard about Josephine or um, 
what they knew about her daughters or her her kids. Um, it was it was one of the most memorable moments of my life, I have to say, uh, when we mm. we got together and and talked about it. And I, one of the things I think that was really funny was um, the book quickly sold out on Amazon um, almost as soon as it was published. And I was talking to some of my relatives and one of them said, confess that she had ordered seven. <laughs> and I said, it's your <laughs> fault. <laughs> the book is sold out. <laughs> but we're just so proud. I mean, this is an incredible book. It's I don't know if you'll put a picture up on the website or not, but it's, you know, it's eight, nine hundred, eight hundred pages. It's huge. It's got these gorgeous pictures in it. Um, and then to, you know, to read your what your family member wrote is is pretty it's pretty fantastic. It is. It's it's a legacy. That whole book is a legacy. And what it provides for the future is amazing to me. Now, as you were uh, sharing what you had about the book, you also um, probably talked about some of the other things that she's written as well. Did what about um, her the Winter Counts review, the poems? She had another piece called Lakota Land Dispositions. Um, all these writings that were so much a part of the her um what she dedicated her her life to did you have a chance to talk about um the book as as it relates to these other works that she had done i know that there was some discussion about her poetry and that she wrote poetry um in my family but uh honestly i we 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 really when we got together that time we really focused on like just talking about this and and also, you know, catching up and family stories and things like that. But I'm anxious. Sure. I actually haven't read too much else. Um, the, you know, there was that book that came out before called, like, With My Own Eyes that was a section of um, of some of what was in this book. And, um, and we all read that and had copies of that as well. Yes. It's an amazing... Um feat that these two women managed to put together. And as I was reading it, I had some, you know, some enlightening, uh, enlightenment come to me regarding the text um, with my own eyes. And um, it occurred to me that there's an awful lot of men uh, historians writing about the warrior life. And in fact, that that is pretty why pretty much why um witness and with my own eyes is so different it provides a background to what was happening to the rest of the population during the time historically so um my discovery was that badleon's book uh susan bordeaux badleon and and josephine's book shared something that was somewhat missing. Let's put it this way. We we see and hear all about the captive stories and about the, the um, movements around on the landscape that had been our tribal landscape, the large Sioux, Sioux Nation borders. So when I'm thinking about that, I was thinking, what did they, what did she have to share that was different? And what it boiled down to was there was an awful lot of, um, relationships that were being built in that time frame. And many of the Indian women were marrying trappers and individuals like this. And 50 years later, we have a program that comes on television called Wagon Train. And it's pretty much James Bordeaux's life. You know, in other words, we were learning all about all these skirmishes that were happening on the landscape. And um, Josephine, writing what she had in Witness, talks about that. And it's even expounded upon it. And this this in huge preponderance of footnotes that Levine had provided corresponds so nicely that these two books, actually, you, you need to read both of them if you're going to really get a good picture of what was happening on in that particular time. Mm. So has the book had any kind of influence for you personally, besides your family um, a celebrity there about <laughs> writing about the Lakota history? Okay, so you asked if uh, 
the book had any influence on me other than the celebrity in my family. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was rather, um, I'm impressed that you have this person in your family that you can relate to on a common ground regarding who you are as a family. But when you look back on it and see what she has written about, does this have any way of opening up other avenues of interest for you, of influence, politics, whatever, Hmm. for the rest of the family? I mean, I will say that during Standing Rock, or what we call Standing Rock, you know, the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline, I pulled the book out and I I looked at the, you know, there's a really good map. Let's see if I can find it. um, That shows the treaty territories. Because I knew that mm-hmm. that they were fighting, there was a, the dispute, you know, had to do with unceded territories. And and so I was looking at them and, and trying to figure out, you know, where the, the pipeline was going and how it affected, uh, if it fell in to the um, 51 or the 68 treaty territory, right? And did it matter? Right. Right? And... Mm-hmm. I think there was something sort of profound about that, about going back to my grandmother's, my great grandmother's book and trying to understand something very serious that was happening right then and there and um, and using that history to be able to, I don't know, even form like just a basic, decent Facebook post about it. (laughs) You know, <laughs> and um, I thought that was pretty remarkable. I know when I when I look at the book, I want to learn Lakota. I want to read and reread and read again the book. And I mean, just now I was just looking, you know, like sometimes I think sometimes what I want to do is like if there's an issue that I'm really interested in, I want to go back and see if there's anything that she wrote about that particular issue. You know, I'm really interested in financial literacy and how we manage our money. And I was just thinking today, like, maybe I'll go back through the book and see where she talked. I know she talked about not having enough money for her diabetes medication and things like that. Um, Maybe I could compile something about that. So in that way, it, it definitely influences me. But like getting involved in politics, I'm a journalist. And so I don't get involved in politics. I report. I try to add a synthesis of what's going on. Um, try my best to keep my own opinions out of things. I know I, I brought the book in with me when um, Standing Rock first started happening, and there was a day that I had to host the show, and I was interviewing the chairman of the Standing Rock tribe at the time, the chairman at the time. And I just brought the book in, like, to give me, you know, a sense of um, strength or, I don't know, maybe like a good luck charm. I was very nervous about interviewing the chairman. (laughs) And I found out... Dave or Yeah, and I found out later he went into the bathroom of his gas station to do the interview so he could have, like, the best possible sound. (laughs) And here I am, like, all nervous, and I've got my great-grandmother's book, and he's crouched down in the bathroom. (laughs) <laughs> well, that goes to show you how real things are out here. <laughs> um, when we're talking about using her as a reference, what she has to say, we really have uh, an opportunity. I, I look at this book as a way of educating our own. It's so full of incredible information that none of us growing up, and, and here I am in my 70s, and I never had any of the background that she lays out so nicely. When I was teaching on Standing Rock, as I mentioned in another episode, I would ask questions about how some of the uh, students, how did you get this name? And there was usually I asked them in a in the context of a writing exercise. And a lot of our students had a real difficult time. I said, you have your family. You can t- visit with them about how you, how does the family have this name? Well, your um, great-grandmother, has done a wonderful job of providing the basis for that with that whole section on the chiefs and how they interacted with one another. And then if you come together cross-reference with 
um, with my own eyes. Mm. You can see who these people are and how they are um, fundamentally um, laying out pathways for us as um, descendants of who they are. So in in a context of a, of education and looking at how this book has potential for the future, we at Oak Lake Writers are so, um, we want to nurture these writers who are reviving um, the interest they have for what is now our tribal homelands, you know, these reservations, to have her book as that um, guide or a foundation makes it so much more uh, clear, especially when we're talking about some of the treaties and how it affects our lives. So in a case like that, um, you have when you read through the book and all, did you see and have a sense of the the connections that she's trying to make regarding who we are as people, how how different we are from others that were in the, that la- landscape. You know, we had these these um, tribal enemies per se, that and they, both of these books reference the same group of people. You know, the Pawnees and and um, you know other tribes. So, did you have you had that kind of connection in terms of getting to know um, Lakota character, um, understanding, basically. I mean, yeah, I wish, I wish I could say, Lenico, I wish I could say yes. Like I read this and now I know what it's like to be a Lakota woman, (laughs) but I don't, I mean, I, I felt, you know, like I felt like I was reading history, but I wasn't really raised in like a traditional family or or with traditional practices and things like that. And so in some ways, it almost felt a little bit like an outsider reaching in, you know, and I wonder if I if I like I I was really focused on the history and, and those kinds of things. And it's been a while. I have to admit, it's been a while since I've been through the book. But how remarkable would it be to be able to read it and connect and feel like you, you know, you're more connected with your culture? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Levine does say at the beginning of the book that Josephine intended for it to be Lakota generated. And it was Lakota centered in terms of character. Mm-hmm. So when we're looking at that, we have um, we have other people that we can see how, at different periods of history, how women behaved in certain certain ways and all. And so when when we think about women and the literature, our, our Lakota literature, um, we see different pictures, different perspectives of how women play out their role in that time frame, in that space, and who they relate to. And I see your, um, uh, Josephine, I see her as being a a major bridge. She did an awful lot of things to connect how people were going to function on the reservations in this place where we now had to live, you know, where we had to make a future for ourselves. And in so doing, we learn an awful lot about how, um, how well schooled she was. Mm. You know, she she did all this interpretive work. She was bilingual. Um, she also had inroads to the church and was able to do an awful lot of um, connections between the city bull, the chiefs, you know, different individuals. And then when she was uh, collecting all this information at the old soldier's home in Hot Springs, that whole um, uh, experience gave me an insight as to how brave she was. She just seemed to have such a fluidity of her ability to move around in different groups. I can't say that for myself. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I, mean, I, I'm not, I haven't uh, the, the, that uh, facility to be able to make those kind of connections. and. 
it certainly does open your eyes as to what kind of a diplomat she was. So when we're looking at her book and how she was, what she was, uh, what was motivating her, I can't help but think to myself that she must have really had an incredible sense of what the future, what lay in the future. Because as we, as we're reading through, we can't help but think about what was going on in the schools. Where were the children? So when, um, when you get together with your family and all, do you talk about how she was able to pull this incredible feat off of writing this book with all the children that she uh, brought into the world? Yeah. Yeah, we do. I mean, one of the things that I've spoken about with my family, with like my immediate family, like my sister, is how much she in some ways assimilated with going to boarding school. So she went to Hampton, which is in in Virginia. And uh, I was just looking at this it's on page 201. And um, she said that there were girls of different tribes that had to room together to make sure that the English language would be used. And then she said the Apache girls were most backward, which I think I'll just put in a, an opinion here. I don't think she was being offensive, but she was meaning like they um, maybe struggled the most to learn English. And um, <laughs> and then so you would get into trouble. She was talking about how you would get into trouble if you spoke your own language and you would get if we had you would get a mark if they caught you speaking it and then a zero and you'd have to work all day Saturday. And if you had two zeros, you have to go to bed without supper. And um, and then she says, you know, how wonderful it was that they they picked it up so quickly. Um. Which today, when we when we hear stories like that, it's part of this boarding school era of sadness, you know, and of, of loss. And um, we just always kind of talked about like it sounded like she really took advantage of an opportunity that she was given that may have been like a negative situation for some, but she realized that she needed to navigate this or things weren't going to work out well. And, mm -hmm. you know, so like, I always think of, because m most of the women in my family married white men. Was it really love or was it, you know, self-preservation of being able to move up in society and have some upward mobility? And so that's, that's some of the things that we talked about. And I know that the, she, she spent her time, she was, she, she was, uh, she was good mom. She was committed to her kids and that she spent her free time, like in the evenings or when the kids were asleep writing and things like that. That's, that's the mm -hmm. story that I've heard, um, about how, how she was able to sort of accomplish this. And then, the um, uh, the other thing, so my sister and I were out traveling one time. We went to the beach. We we lived on the East Coast for a long time. And we went to the beach and um, we were near Hampton, Virginia. And my sister was like, let's go to the school and see if we can read some records of Josephine's. You know, maybe they have her school records. And we got all excited. And so we went there and we went to the archives and we, you know, there was a helpful archival librarian there. And and we told her, you know, her name and she went back and she came back with this file in her hand. And she said, um, do you have any identification that can prove that you're related to her? And, you know. Both of us, my, my last name is Brain. It's not Wagner. And, you know, we, we don't carry around, <laughs> like, family trees <laughs> and birth certificates and things like that. And this was when my grandfather was still alive. And so we were just like, well, can you just take our word for it? And she was like, no, these are, these are school records. These are, um, you, this is personal information. We need to have whoever the living family member the like oldest living family member of her is we they need to fill out this form and sign it and send it to us and then you'll get the and uh so 
we were so excited. And then we just turned around and left like with our heads hanging. And my sister, she get, we get in the car and I'm like, I cannot believe that just happened. And she was like, I just wanted to snatch that folder out of her hand. <laughs> And there was like this some like righteous indignation, you know, like, how dare she? That's our family information. But at the same time, we were like, well, we wouldn't just want anybody to be able to get a hold of this stuff. You know, it's deeply personal, her her information. So we had, we got our grandpa to fill out a form and we were able to get the papers uh, later, which didn't actually have that much information in it. Um, but. The whole experience was, you know, I was I was ready to, like, start marching on the lawn out front because I was so irritated. <laughs> well, getting back to what you were saying earlier about um, what women had to do, um, I also think that, and, and again, you know, I'd have to do a lot more research, but I'm pretty sure it won't be too terribly hard to come by. But I think a lot of what was happening with our Indian women marrying um, non-natives was not just for upward mobility, but survival. I I do believe that um, they would be on the inside learning about what, what is going on with the movements and all, especially having to have a facility for language, you know, the English and all. And... Uh, and my own family, I know my grandmother was, she was fluent in more than one language, you know, uh, Lakota, uh, Hidatsa. Also, um, she uh, was able to get around in French as well. And having read uh, notes and all regarding the Wagner um, Bordeaux Badlion papers, you you see that you see there was a an amazing um, ability for these women to have acquired the facility of language to be able to help them be more mobile, um, get through things accomplished, take care of their children, make sure that they were able to participate and do things that were going to be for the betterment of the whole family. So going to Hampton, um, she talks about that in her book. Uh, she talks about the farm school on Shine, on uh, Standing Rock. And um, she talks a lot about the, the church mission, and it's when she's involved with the um, St. Elizabeth and this church mission that she encounters um, um, Sitting Bull and becomes involved in that period of history that is oftentimes written about by men. And she um, shared a lot more about what was happening in, this, in the experiences of women who were witness to what was going on. So um, education must have meant an awful lot to her. I I also got the feeling that she had a she had embraced poetry in such a way that she was able to encapsulate some in, incredible events, having had uh, the facility in English. You know, as a as a person looking from the perspective of, of a Lakota person. So taken us to language and your desire to learn Lakota. So many um, so many young people who, like myself, had gone, um, were taken very young age into um, boarding school and then from there to mission school when, you know, that happened for me. We were taken away from what was happening in terms of our own history. We were being uh, for a lack of a better word, being indoctrinated. Some people call it assimilation and all these other sort of things. But in the process of all that, language is um, suppressed. Native language is suppressed by these individuals, myself included. So um, to to have the courage to be able to meet that diversity, that diversity of um, languages and facilitate her own ability to communicate on all those various levels must have been um, exciting for her as well. Mm -hmm. Did she ever talk about, does, do any of the members of your family talk about her own childhood experiences? I haven't heard too much about that. Um, just, just that things were like challenging and it was, you know, it was at a time when the country was at, incredible turmoil mm -hmm. and 
you know, it was the, the beginning of the end in some ways, <laughs> or um, I like to think of it as like a new chapter pretty much. But I know that um, she really valued education. And so she, she um, try, made sure that she, her kids were educated. She sent many of them to Carlisle on purpose, deliberately sent them to Carlisle because she believed that she could see, you know, what was going on and she could see that there was the, the way to survive in all of this had to be some adopting of white man's ways and things like that. And I remember reading a letter, I think it was, um, it may have been like when I got the Carlisle records that she wrote where um, one of her sons was not permitted to come back to Carlisle because he didn't have enough blood quantum. And she was saying, your records are not right, or this is, you know, this isn't fair for him in the middle of the school year and things like that. And so, you know, what we were saying earlier about like um, doing this thing where it had to do with survival, like being with uh, all these white men um, or, or connecting with them, right. And having these kids with them as part of survival is also like part of our, our struggle because of the way that tribes are set up now and with blood quantum and things like that. There was a lot of assimilation in our family and there was a lot of non-natives that um, came into the sphere. And, you know, so sometimes when I think about like, what would she think of me today, you know, and would she be proud of the work that I'm doing? And um, being, I'm pretty light skinned. My mom is white. And um, sometimes I think about like, would she, would she be proud of me or would she think like, oh, you know, you're just, you're not that native. You shouldn't even have, you shouldn't even bother to like identify yourself as native or something like that. And I, and I hear that voice and I'm like, I doubt she would have said that to me. I really, you know, based on everything that she wrote about how important it was to tell these stories and to tell them correctly. And this is something that I'm doing as a journalist is like, we have to get this stuff right. I don't know how many times I, a year I email non-native journalists and I'm like, great article, but here's some things that you did wrong or Hey, do you think that you could have used a better picture than a powwow dancer to talk about COVID-19? You know, and I, I think about right. those things and I think maybe she, I think she would have been proud. I think she's proud of me, you know, um, considering oh, sure those circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, the thing about it is uh, she would look at you and probably say that you you are a voice. You have a you are a voice that many ears hear through the, what you're doing. And that's terribly important because when I looked over what, when I was reading the book and also um, with my own eyes, I couldn't help but think to myself how incredibly important these two books are to be incorporated in the core curriculum for all the reservation schools, especially those who are descendants mm. from the individuals who are in those two books. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it behooves me to um, wonder how it that would um, have changed our lives. You know, it it would have had um, a whole different cast over what some of us had lived through. But on the other hand, um, I also feel that the reason why her books had such a difficult time getting published is because truth telling is very hard to take. Mm -hmm. Um, if you hear the truth and you are one of those who are trying to create a new story or a different story or push an agenda, when truth tellers are um, so bold as to put that out there, the gatekeepers close that off. And it's taken what what the book was that published in 1998, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so there you have whole two, three generations, you know, we waited for this to come forward because I think the other one was published in 2013, if I remember correctly, right. with my own eyes. So we, we just went through list, reading and, and digesting uh, Water Lily and the Spotted Eagle shared an awful lot about how Ella Deloria's perspective cast a light of a longing look backward 
to a degree that it, that vision would be able to push forward to re- rekindle that uh, connection of women's societies within um, the bands and in some cases the clans. Um, I think this book has the same potential for being able to do that. Like the like a revival, is, you mean? Well, I think Faith indicated uh, in her discussion about Water Lily, there's an institute um, um, that celebrates the, 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 the ways of women and the coming of age experience. And that um, has a way of bringing back, uh, bring or oh, actually taking backward into time some of those values and bringing them forward to a better understanding of what it is that we're responsible for when we look at ourselves as women. And I think she does a very good job of providing this opportunity for many of the descendants of Deloria and Wagner and all the various individuals who have connections to the Oche de Chacoy. So when we look at her um, Wagner's um, book. We we don't just get in a car and drive across from one place to another on the reservation. We should be able to point out where the different things took place because if you look at the book and you and you read through it very carefully about how the landscape had changed and all, as you had mentioned earlier, there are all these events that have different names. And some of those names will, if they're not a part of the family stories, they will be lost if it had not been for people like Josephine Wagner to make that a part of um, a tangible way to recall who we are, where we are, and what are we today because of that that book and mm-hmm. what she has been able to, to share with us. So um, when it comes to language also, for many years I was listening to um, difficulties of getting the native language in the um, community experiences on a reservation. This was about 20, 30 years ago. The squabble was about Dakota or Lakota, and very little was laid as a foundation to tell how these dialectical differences are connected to the bands. And Josephine Wagner points that out very clearly, what, what one needs to know about those differences and how they came to be. And those relationships that came about as a, as a result of the bands performing different things in different parts of the landscape. So what she did was provided us a, a wonderful opportunity for us to develop our own core curriculum that is um, Ocheti Shakoi. It's, it is a um, part of her legacy, is if we could pick that up. She left those those threads, those um, I call them threads. They were all, all, they're all there, you know. And she's got that all uh, so well crafted and placed in her book that we're able to. Uh, if we didn't know who we came from or where we came, where, if we were adopted out or whatever, we have a beginning. We have a way to get back, not just to the tribal roles, but to the stories that are a part of the who you are. Uh, who you come from, mm. and then from there you can build your um, uh, your pedigree or whatever they call it, your genealogy, because you know it's not just chemical; it's the stories that make you who you are. If you haven't heard them, here was an opportunity to open that door, open those pages to um, even strengthening the family ties as a result of doing that. So, if I was, if I had any influence at all, I would. Be indicating that we uh, tribal chairman ought to read this book, mm-hmm. Standing Rock, Shine River. All of our Ocheti leadership should read this book and help the communities to establish um, some of the networking of build, rebuilding our our um, cultural values, our ties, not quibbling over language, dialect, and things of this nature, but rekindling and strengthening as faith modic. Uh, Eagle had indicated that her efforts are towards it with um, uh, the Water Lily Institute. So, um, yeah. as we're looking about uh, what kind of um, oral traditions do you have in your family about that tied to the book? Are there anything? Are there any special um, 
stories that are <laughs> that are specifically uh, or maybe relatively, however which way you want to put it, that speak to the difficulties of how this book came about? I mean, there was always this story about that she wrote she wrote books for other historians and that they stole her work and claimed it for themselves. And it always came up as like this discussion about like what, how terrible something, you know, that was and how we had this, this historian in our family who, um, you know, just didn't get the credit she deserved. And, um, Another story that I heard, I don't know <laughs> if this is, <laughs> I can't remember if this is in the book or not, but this is the story that I've heard in my family is that she got into trouble when she went to Hampton because she became friends with, or maybe a little more than friends with one of the black students at Hampton and the, you know, the fraternization between them was not supposed to happen at all, but like she caused quite a scandal um, with that. Uh, did did I didn't remember seeing yeah, that? Yeah, no, no, you're you're correct. You're correct. I think it's in the book. <laughs> and also, uh, as a result of that, uh, had you been able to get to see her records there, there probably would have been a notation to that because I think Emily Levine was able to get that information. <laughs> That's right. Um, and that became a part of the book. It, and it 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 made me wonder about. Um, this was considered a, an experimental school. Mm -hmm. So what had they expected? You know, what was their expectation that um, people who were oppressed were sending their children there and these children were learning about those kinds of things and they were developing on a on a nurturing level a better understanding of who they were and why they were there. They were all, everybody that was there supposedly were all very progressive um, um, intellectually, um, shi you know, they were shining stars in the communities they had come from is what, it, you know, I don't exactly have the quote to that, but they were all exemplary individuals, young people. It was looked upon by Pratt and a few other people in literature, if you, uh, in the historical records there, that these were individuals they thought were going to be going home and helping the acculturation process come to be. So, um, yeah, I can see where um, if the uh, school was frowning on, um, you know, relationships that were blooming beyond the classroom, <laughs> um, <laughs> to put it in a different way, <laughs> uh, that they would have had something to say about that. But I think more than anything was chastising her for not um, maybe sticking to the core of what they intended for her, you know, to be yeah. her, to keep her isolated so she would have a uh, concentrated um, exposure to what was the the, uh, the culture, the, the evolving changes for both Native Americans and African Americans. So, um, I mean, I look at that in a different perspective than, um, I mean, I think she had gone, you know, she was very much um, engaged in learning. That's, that's a given. But um, about a romantic relationship that was frowned upon and she was sent home, She apparently she was sent home as a result of that. Yeah, that's what we heard in the family too. That So it was, I always heard of her as like this rebel who also, you know, um, did a lot for our family and did a lot for history and 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 culture er, and our culture and stuff like that. And it really wasn't until Emily put all of these, put it all together in this massive book that I was able to really connect with that and 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 think a little bit, too, about like, OK, because sometimes I act a little bit rebellious, too. I've ever <laughs> since I was little or since I was younger, I always have fought against um mascots even when it was like not popular at all i had like no friends in school because i was like you guys got to get rid of this horrible mascot it's it's the worst you know and um there would even be like native people who would come and talk to me and say like nobody cares about that that's not a real issue monica you know and um mm -hmm. and when i read about her i'm like 
maybe it's genetic. Like we have just a little bit of like, oh, I'm going to fight against this or I'll do what I want. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, we have uh, lots of issues, but they all go back to the same. And she spent a lot of time focusing on the land. Mm. And how incredibly important it was for us to be aware of how we needed to play a part in what was going on. Actually, she uh, we bring that uh, I brought that reasoning to what she wrote because um, in with my own eyes they talk about how um, certain groups were for signing the treaty, the the the, the second treaty, mm -hmm. the, not the fifty one, but the sixty eight. Mm -hmm. Um, and what was the result of that within the community, uh, the dynamics of the communities changed and nothing was left out because as a result of some of those changes, there was, uh, something as petty as jealousy that cost crazy horses life, you know, it, so that kind of thing, um, what man would be spending the time to relate on that level at that particular time about these dynamics? And yet it's all a part of what uh, was the focus of um, not just Josephine Wagner, but the woman she had um, acted as a um, kind of like a scribe. She helped to compile all of that in um, Bordeaux Badlion's book. So, yeah, I. Uh, I would have to say being a rebel also means you probably have the ability to see a little bit further ahead than most people of what the significance of that was and some of the things that are being left out as a result of not paying attention. And I think she did a wonderful job of, of integrating a huge amount of um, knowledge that um, – yeah, Emily Levine did a wonderful job of pulling all these other cross references that come from male writers, and and of course, in so doing, she's able to provide all the notes, all the maps, um, the ethnographic writings of all those chiefs and all, as well as the outcomes of some of those the legislative uh, and. Um, not legislative, but um, the Indian agency, the Indian commissioner um, activities among the tribes. My question is, so, how, how do we how do we teach this to, you know, like seventh graders or I mean, because the book is massive and to ask young people to read it, I think is maybe maybe they would. But is there a way to, like, take what she wanted us to know and and to pull it out and and share it in another way or um, synthesize it for young people. Oh, I think it's absolutely um, important that we do that. And one of the things that I think was would be very well um, connected to that kind of education would be maps, because the maps mm -hmm. relate to who was where, when, and um, so ma visuals are very much a part of our learning experience. And maps do a wonderful job of helping us get through the years that unfold as we read these um, incredible books. I can't say, um, let's just put it this way. I, I would say that both books have to work together in tandem. Mm. Um, simply because there's, there's that element of um, Bordeaux Badlion's um, half-breed life that's different from Josephine Wagner's life. Mm -hmm. And and that element of women and how women um, dealt with what they had to deal with at that particular time and how they resolved that and what were some of the experiences of the the, the cultures uh, changing, uh, not changing so much as um, having to accommodate for for different kinds of things. I was reading in, and um, I think I had to go back to, um, with my own eyes, to find out about these two women who died because they were, um, they died because they, um, they died of broken heart, let's put it that way. I, and the reason why it, it stuck in my mind is because the one woman's name is Wasna, um, the sweet meat, the pumpkin. And I 
when I was reading through that, I was thinking to myself, well, now here was someone who's longing for a relationship with one of her own, and yet she was sold to a white man. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's two stories like that. Um, And I think they're both of them. um, I think they're both in with my own eyes. But when it comes to um, those dynamics of, of the boarding schools and the mission schools, you're your ancestor did a wonderful job of share, of sharing how what was happening in those schools was a reflection of her own experience at Hampton. To try to keep her away from what was the, the um, relationship of an African American, um, and you know to keep her focused on what she was going to be all about when she graduated out of there. And then the same kind of thing that was happening here, what your ancestor was aware of was that the boarding schools and the mission schools were, um, they were bent on changing the way we were as people. So in a way, these women have done a wonderful job of of showing how difficult it was. It was a struggle to be able to um, survive and yet at the same time, survive with all of that knowledge going forward with them through their lives. Have you ever seen that meme that's like this guy is sitting on the floor and he's he's so excited because there's this little kitten that's eating (laughs) and he's got this face like I'm so excited, you know, like, oh, this kitten. (laughs) Um. It says, it, it, the meme says, um, me trying to speak my, my, my native language, brokenly trying to speak my native language. And it's the kitten is labeled as that. And then the, the guy, they said, my ancestors looking down on me, like all excited about it, you know, like here I'm trying to do something, you know? And, um, I think about that, like when you're talking about the schools, like, Man, I'd love to take, you know, if if I could have her here today, I would take her to the Native American Community Academy in Albuquerque and show her, like, look what these Native kids are up to. Look at these schools or mm-hmm. take her to one of the immersion schools around the country, the the Lakota language nest with the babies and speaking the language and stuff like that. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'd love to have a conversation with her about how different it is now. And it's because of things that she did because you know she refused to she refused to say you know just go off quietly in the into the darkness to accommodate yep to accommodate to whoever's in charge you know that that was not her goal so keeping alive these books these two books terribly important for uh, young people today for those of us who have uh we're at the we're on the the last leg of our journey around the circle of life. Um, we still have so much to learn and so much to appreciate for what they have invested in our future. You know, because they they left that for us, and that's that's wonderful. And I'm so happy that you've been able to share all of that with us. How much she meant to you and your family, and still means that much. So yeah, I think those seventh graders would benefit greatly from natural landmarks that's pointed out in the prairie landscape. And uh, when they recover the language, when they have the language, they are able to associate um, living things in the landscape that are critical to knowing the language. All of these things are all the foundation for what it means to recover our culture through the works of Josephine Wagner, um, Susan bordeaux Badleon, and Ella Deloria and people like her. Um, we have some new writers, too, that are coming up, and they are bringing with their wisdom so much for strengthening that what I call the Ocheti Shakoi um, literary canon. It's growing. <laughs> hmm. I'm excited to 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 read more um, and to you've you've um, reinvigorated my desire to. Um, really focus on Lakota writers and just really connect with 
with my own culture and connect in a way that, you know, is so much more than just a surface of being able to like say, oh, this is who I am and this is what I do, you know? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, terribly important. It it makes you feel like you are whole when we have all these parts put back in, in proper place because we have people who devoted their lives to giving us what we can tangibly hold and read and digest on our own at our own pace. Um, one of the things that the uh, Oak Lake Writers Society aspired to do is to in, in, uh, to invigorate reading in the families, of, but reading our own Ocheti Shakoi authors. And so that's how this book became a part of that. So um, have you had a chance to go online to um, check out all the books that were of that 10 survey, the 10 books that were... Yeah, I, I I looked at the list briefly and I was like, uh, I got some work to do. <laughs> I think I read half of that book. Uh, I, you know, nope, didn't read that book at all. All right. I'm just going to make myself a list. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> yes, well, it's exciting. You know, I, I have to tell, I'll tell you that I came out of a, um, a tradition of being sent away to school and then eventually getting sent away to college, you know, so everything that was coming at me was pretty much the Euro-American perspective of literature, American and European as well. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been a, it's been a wonderful awakening for me to, to find all these books and reading them and enjoying them, but also and educating myself to, as to the core of who I am. So I think that's what we have to, we can look forward to, is we see um, organizations like the Oak Lake Writers with these study guides. We brought into um, the home some ways to discuss what is important, and those can be broken down even further and made more uh, accessible to the younger generation. And we also have a lot of young generation writers, you know, younger people who are writing a children's books and all bringing us um some of them are also com coming to the readership in in Lakota as well Dakota the language is not going to be left behind when we take on some of the oral traditions that are part of these stories but the historian we can't forget the historian who invested her life in witness Ahung Papa historian strong heart song of the Lakotas Thank you, Josephine Wagner. And thank you very much, Monica Brain, for sharing what you did today. Oh, thank you. It's been a it's been a pleasure to talk to with you and I feel really inspired. I'm glad. Or well maybe we can make notes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep in touch. Now now I'm thinking, <laughs> oh my gosh, I I have to make a study guide. I have to make a study guide for, for seventh graders on this using this. I think that's a splendid assignment. Perfect. <laughs> Not that I don't have anything else going on right now, but <laughs> no, we're 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 not busy at all. <laughs> oh, I can't oh, wait goodness. to meet you in person when uh, when this whole thing is over. I would love to come and visit you and and say hello and face to face and shake your hand. Absolutely, absolutely. That'll be part of our agenda. Okay, <laughs> our future. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Thank you. And all of you from Oak Lake Writers, all of the listeners of the podcast, the podcast, I should say, we all thank you so much for taking the time to share what you did with us. Absolutely.